Question? Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. My pleasure to be in this nice place for the second time this year. And uh, I would like to, talk, uh, to, uh, to thank uh, GND. And uh, as the president of the Brazilian Society for Virology, I could not uh, realize that is missing a point in Brazil for the global <laughs> network of virus. So you guys should look to us. We probably we have something that in Brazil that we can help you guys. So uh, I would like to make an update about yellow fever. So by the regulations of the Brazilian Medical Association, I have to make a couple of disclosures saying that, that I have no conflict regarding yellow fever vaccine, but uh, I had a patent uh, regarding the treatment of yellow fever using MAP kinase inhibitors. And I have some conflict regarding dengue vaccine. I'm not going to talk about anything about dengue vaccine. And I would like to thank Dr. Marcus Freire from Fio Cruz. He shared some slides that I'll show you about yellow fever production. And Dr. Betania Drummond from Federal University of Minas Gerais who shared some unpublished data about regarding yellow fever outbreak in Brazil. Uh, it's really sad to me to talk about yellow fever outbreak in Brazil, especially because most of the basic knowledge that we have about yellow fever and the most important knowledge that we have is over, it's pretty much over a century old. Uh, I really like to find this data from uh, this publication by Walter Reed in 1901 that pretty much Everything that we need to know about yellow fever is here. The mosquitoes is an intermediate host for the parasite of yellow fever. Yellow fever is transmitted to no immune individuals by the bite of mosquitoes have pres that has previously fe fed on blood of sick, uh, sick patients. Yellow fever can be experimentally produced. Yellow fever is not conveyed by formats and disinfection or articles of clothing is not need. And then, the most important, the spread of yellow fever can be most effectively controlled by measures direct to destruction, destruction of mosquitoes. So in 1901, Walter Reed said pretty much everything that we need to know. And then 1930, Max Tyler came with the vaccine. So pretty much came over. So why? Over a hundred years later, we're still discussing yellow fever. Why does this happen? So, of course, I don't need to tell you, but uh, yellow fever is the prototype of the flavivirus. Uh, it's a small RNA virus and has two cycles. And that's the important thing about that. A sylvatic cycle and a urban cycle. Uh, in Brazil, we eliminated the urban cycle in 1942. But since we have a sylvatic cycle with a host inside the jungle, uh, the yellow fever is impossible to eradicate in Brazil because we have hosts uh, in this jungle. And these are the main victims of yellow fever in Brazil. These three species of monkeys. The alawata, this one, the cebus, and this, the calitrix or the marmoset. Uh, it's important to remember that these monkeys, or, or, or the, it's possible to remember that the yellow fever virus is completely exotic to these monkeys. These species of no human primates are completely different from the species that we have in Africa and Asia. They've been separated several, several thousands or millions of years ago. So, uh, not millions, but anyway. <laughs> so, they are extremely uh, vulnerable to this virus. This is an exotic virus for them. Uh, these animals can be a host, they amplify the virus, and they can disseminate it because they move around especially in the central south Brazil, they move around the small pockets of forest, uh, leading to dissemination of the yellow fever. Uh, these two species are the more susceptible to the yellow fever. 
the Alawaka, uh, are, they got really sick. They die of yellow fever. And the mortality rate is over 90% for these monkeys. Uh, <coughs> but on the other hand, this one, the calitrix, the marmosets, are really susceptible to the infection, but they don't die usually from yellow fever. So they really disseminate the virus around. And as you can see, they are common in the most populated area of Brazil, that's the central south. And even worse, they are um, adapted to the urban environment. They are living around the big cities and sometimes inside the big cities in Brazil. On the other hand, we have these three mosquitoes. Of course, we don't have AIDS transmitting uh, yellow fever in Brazil, at least not evidence of a, uh, a reasonable transmission. And these are the two most important factors, the hemagogos and the probably the most beautiful mosquitoes that I know, the sabetes. <laughs> They're really beautiful <laughs> ones. <laughs> Scott has a colony in, in Galveston. There's a really blue mosquito. It's really nice to see. Uh, they are vectors. They can be reservoirs. And they can be disseminated, of course, in a much less uh, <laughs> distance. And of course, I don't, want, don't need to talk to this about the disease yellow fever. It's a systemic disease. It's a hemorrhagic disease. But this uh, severe form that uh, we see is only the tip of the iceberg of the disease. So when we talk about in Brazil, and we have this data from the last year, a 50% mortality rate, that's not true. What we I'm saying is that we are not seeing these cases here. We only see the tip of the iceberg. Uh, usually the mortality rate will be 90% over this severe form that's less, it's something between five or to 10%. All doing a mathematic basic one. If I'm seeing a 50% mortality rate means that I'm missing probably uh, 10 times more cases. So when I'm talking about over a thousand cases of yellow fever, I probably have something about 10,000 infections of yellow fever. So what is the current situation of the yellow fever in Brazil? Uh, in the world, we know that this is the transmission area for yellow fever, the risk for yellow fever. And in 2016, we have an outbreak in Africa. Uh, and this outbreak in Africa, in, uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola, have some implications to Brazil. Oops, not good color. Why I'm saying that? We have cases in Angola. Uh, these cases in Angola spill over to Kenya and China. We have uh, cases in Congo. And the problem that, at that time, we need 30 million people to be vaccinated of yellow fever. There was not uh, enough vaccine in WHO. The WHO uh, looked for the vaccines in the biggest producer, that is Brazil. So Brazil put all the, the stocks to WHO and sent to Africa. That's fine, as we expected. What we did not expect it is to have an outbreak in the next year in Brazil. <coughs> and this outbreak, exploded in the central south of Brazil. Just to put in perspective, between 1980 and 2015, we had a, a 1,500 cases in Brazil. In the last two years, over 2,000 cases. It's the biggest outbreak ever of yellow fever in Brazil. And 2,000 uh, cases with 744 dead people. So as you can see here, we don't need to be do any statistics <laughs> to see that we have a huge outbreak. And over 5,000 new human primates were found dead. Uh, most of them linked to yellow fever. 
Some are not linked to yellow fever, but were detected by surveillance, and most of them were not tested. And this state, Minas Gerais, was the, I uh, can say, the epicenter of the, of the outbreak. And we need, to we need to pay attention to Minas Gerais. Why? The, in this region here, it's the border between Sao Paulo and Minas Gerais. In 2000, we had an outbreak of yellow fever. I'm talking about 18 years ago. Uh, and we proposed to vaccinate all this part of the state here. Here is the San Francisco River. So all the left margin of the river was put in the vaccination uh, area in 2000. In 2008, we have another outbreak here, 18 years later, as expected. Uh, and the government proposed to vaccinate the whole state. 2008, 80 years later, 2016, we still have not vaccinated the state. So in Brazil, we know how to vaccinate children. We are really good at that. But we don't know how to vaccinate adults in Brazil. So when the yellow fever got here, we have several cities with lower than 50% vaccination rate. And what happened? An outbreak in 2017, and then the continuous outbreak to 2018. Uh, and of course, when it got here, that spill over to Espirito Santo and Rio de Janeiro, the borders of the states. Uh, as far as I know, the mosquito does not respect borders. Well, the government said yes, but. <laughs> uh, also, the government said that between these two outbreaks, the outbreak was over. As soon as the outbreak was declared over by the government, we had a, a few more cases and the, someone from the press asked me, what I was thinking, I said, I said that the mosquito didn't get the memo <laughs> from the government. <laughs> so we will look into this outbreak, and there is some uh, amino acid substitution in this uh, virus, but uh, we don't think that there's nothing generic related to that. None of these are markers for virulence, but also there is a lot of things that need to be done. And different from uh, the Zika outbreak that happened three years ago, at the time of the Zika outbreak, the Brazilian labs were funded and staffed. At this time, we are not funded, we are not staffed. The Brazilian is living one of the worst economical crises in history. So uh, most of the labs don't have people or money to do the work. So we're relying a lot of collaborations and uh, trying to rely on collaborators but it's been a difficult time. So this being published by Nuno, showing that this virus has the most recent ancestor in July 2016, but he was looking only for samples in Minas Gerais and Rio de Janeiro. He's forgetting about Sao Paulo State. And this work done by um, the group of Dr. Bethania Drummond put the ancestors in 2016 in monkey samples from Sao Paulo State. What it really looks like is the virus is starting in Sao Paulo State, disseminated to Minas and then to the other regions. And in fact, in 2016, we have several uh, cases in human primates in this region. And this one, this is my city, and this is Ribeirão Preto. And we have the two hum first human cases were here. Uh, but this does not explode why. This is a region that has been vaccinated for over 25 years. The vaccination rate here is over 95%. These two cases that we have, human cases here in 2016, were two people who lives in other parts of the country, moved to Sao Paulo, and did not get vaccinated. The first one in my city was an engineer. He went to fish in a small pocket of forest in my city, they call it the monkey forest. <laughs> and it's written, there is a, when you get to this forest, there is a, a sign saying that this is an endemic yellow fever area. Please don't go inside if you're not vaccinated. And he went there to fish. 
The other one was uh, also a, a CEO of a company who moved to Ribeirão Preto here and bought a really fancy house in the border of the pocket of forest. He was visited by the public health and said, look, guy, you have to vaccinate to yellow fever. And he said, no, this does not exist anymore. And he died two months later. So this is what we have in Sao Paulo. This is uh, monkeys and uh, human cases here, predominant monkeys. But look this. You see this huge amount of human and monkey cases here? What do you have here? We have Sao Paulo, the city of Sao Paulo, with 18 million people. If you get here a little bit further, it's Campinas, the second biggest city in Sao Paulo, with over 5 million people city. If you go here, it's the Santos de Harbor, uh, and you have also a few million people. All this area together has about 25 to 30 million people living here and nobody was ever vaccinated in this area because it's supposed to be yellow fever free. The line was pretty much here in the past. So now we have these three, four states of the central South Brazil. And these four states together holds about 45 million people, all of them not vaccinated. And what's really bothering us is this. When, remember when I said the Calitrix, the Marmoset, is, get, is adapted to big cities? This is a map of Belo Horizonte. It's the capital of Minas Gerais state with pretty much almost six million people in the whole region. You can see uh, monkeys, infected monkeys, inside the city. And you see in more details they are found in these small pockets of forest. You see here, this is the university in Belo Horizonte, and you found infected uh, monkeys, um, something about two miles from the university. So the virus is probing the big cities. For some reason, we still don't have evidence yet of urban transmission. If it's by lucky, if it's by vector competence, is why? I cannot tell you. We can discuss this the whole day with hypotheses, but uh, it's not being proven yet, anything. But again, this population is not full vaccinated yet. So what about the vaccine? Everybody knows about this vaccine. This vaccine derived from this guy, Azibi, who was infected. This vaccine was passed over 200 times, and we have today pretty much two different vaccines, the 17D strain and the 17DD strain. And of course, I'm not gonna go into details on that, but what I would like to point it out that the history of these two vaccines is really different. The name is pretty close, but the vaccines are not. The 17DD is being used in Brazil, and the 17D is used in most parts of the world. So there are different vaccines with different genetic um, signatures, and also they have different um, uh, adverse reactions uh, in different populations. The problem is that most of the plants that produce the 17D and the derived 17D uh, to 114 are now closed. We have just three or four manufacturers working on that. And this is how we produced vaccines in Brazil in 1942. As you see, it's a manual procedure. And can you imagine? We're still pretty much doing the same thing. And uh, we're still doing manual injection, checking the, the egg one by one by eye, producing this, <laughs> I like to say, this soup <laughs> so, uh, or the blend of eggs, and this derives to the vaccine. And then this vaccine has been produced in the same way for many, many, many years. If you look to the 
vaccine produced in Brazil, and if you look to the vial, there is no reference for how much infectious dose there is in the vaccine because it's not controlled. There is a range between every law. We know that the vaccine is being over uh, dosed for years and years and years, uh, but not every lot is tested to know how many particles are in each one. They have a new plant now. Um, what's happened? Uh, this is a new plant that is start to be used this year. Um, it's, part, it's now being evaluated by WHO to be regulated, so, but it is still is already working to produce the vaccines that we need in Brazil because we need to vaccinate 80 million people. So there is some questions about the duration of immunity by this vaccine. Uh, WHO said that the booster is not needed anymore. Uh, sometimes I think that this is more political than technical, but we have some evidence uh, from both sides, these people in Brazil say that they think that they need a booster because the uh, levels of antibody vanishes over time. Uh, but on the other hand, we start to use the fractionated doses uh, initially in, uh, in Africa and now we're do doing this in Brazil. Uh, this was back at Bicej. Uh, was a political and technical decision because there was a shortage of vaccine at the time. Since we know that the vaccine is a, has more infectious unit than need, why not we can do that? And after that was published this paper showing about the immunogenicity of the fractional dose of the vaccine. This is a preliminary report. But they use, what they use is a marker of protection. They use a PRNT 50, 1 to 10. Look, if you go to a Brazilian population, everybody has a PRNT 50, 1 to 10 higher because we have so many flavivirus infection that everybody gonna have these antibody levels. I don't think that was a good way to measure that. I'm not saying that's wrong. I think that's not the, probably the best way to measure this. And this was published uh, two days ago, uh, showing the long-term protection of these uh, vaccinated doses. And this time they use a better, um, they consider positive uh, PRNT 80, 1 to 20. And they think that this is a better um, marker. And they show that 10 years later, we still have more antibodies than that. So, um, we still have, probably we can use a fractionated dose. We're, we're gonna have a long-term immunity, but uh, I believe that the jury is still out about the need of boost or not. Over the last years, we've seen serious adverse events of the vaccine. They have been published by the, with the Brazilian vaccine, the European vaccine. So we are seeing more reports of the adverse effects uh, we don't know. There is no evidence of uh, change on the, the virus. It's not a reversion of the phenotype. What probably is happening now, we are looking in more details on that. In the past, we have in this uh, large scale vaccination in the northeast of Brazil, we are not seeing what's happened after the vaccination. Now we are vaccinating more people in the south of Brazil. We have a better surveillance system. We probably detect these events that are coming. Five minutes? One? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this serious adverse event about half of one million, but we need to vaccinate 80 million people in Brazil. So we are expecting a lot of uh, adverse in, in effects. So about the vaccines, we have several new proposals about the vaccines, both by DNA vaccines, inactivate vaccines, subunit vaccines, all of them have been published, several different ways of vaccine, but how to do a clinical trial of a vaccine that cost us less than $1? That's the cost of the uh, Brazilian vaccine now. 
is there a market for that? If we're gonna do what, how we're gonna do this trial? What's the ethical considerations? What's the population to do that? What's the surrogate markers of protection if you're not doing an efficacy trial? We don't know that. That's gonna cost a, a lot of money. So yellow fever is re-emerging in South America and Africa in a higher than usual number of cases. There is a good vaccine. We can use this vaccine, but not enough vaccine available right now. There is not enough. The stocks of vaccine are in the record low. Uh, there is technology for new vaccines, but there is market interest on these new vaccines. Uh, and there is no drug license. There is some experience in Brazil now with the use of sofosfibir in this uh, yellow fever out outbreak, but uh, it's pretty much done. I was showing something else, but I'm gonna finish here, okay? Thank you.